we let the Lord down. His grace, His mercy endureth forever. Isn't that great? We're going to be in Ephesians chapter number 5. <coughs> Ephesians chapter number 5. I want to preach tonight on snapping the devil's bonds, snapping the devil's bonds. God saves a soul to advance beyond justification. When we are saved, we're justified, just as if I'd never sinned, justified, right with God for salvation. But then there's another step called sanctification. And that's when we grow from our present condition closer to him. There's things in our life we give up and we incorporate new things into our life. And so that's sanctification. Now, there's different kinds of sanctification. There's the sanctification of growing in, in, in the, our walk with the Lord. And then there's uh, sanctification of being separated. And then there's sanctification when we get to heaven we'll be totally separated from sin. I mean, we're, we won't be in the presence of sin anymore. And I want to talk about being sanctified by snapping the devil's bonds. Bondage. People get saved, and oftentimes they give the devil some ground in their life, and he has some control over them. You know how the politicians do. You, the politicians because of some things they allow to creep into their lives and become suspect because of their dishonesty or disloyalty to the country. And, and then somebody gets something on them and they blackmail them and they can't really do what they ought to do because somebody's got dirt on them. You know that, right? And the devil wants to get some dirt on you and, and me. And he wants to ruin our life, keep us from growing closer to the Lord, keep us from becoming more sanctified in our life. And there's people that allow the devil to get a stronghold in their life. And once he gets a stronghold, it's like a fort. It's like <laughs> he's got his strength built right into the center of a person. And it's hard to push him away because he's got a, a stronghold there, that bondage. And that's what we have to break. He sets up a campground in the life of a believer. Now, the soul is saved, but the life doesn't reflect what God wants it to be. And Satan gets inside, and he can't possess you as a Christian, but he can set up a stronghold, and he can hinder you greatly from growing in the Lord. He sets up that fort, the stronghold, and from there he works his way through your life to make you a weak Christian and not live up to your potential. Now in our text in Ephesians uh, 4, 22, I believe it's, yeah, chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse number 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry, ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now look at verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. That's saying don't let him set up camp in your life, in your heart. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking 
be put away from you with all malice. This is sort of a, a scary verse in a sense, and yet it holds the keys to our success as a Christian. If the devil can set up camp in your life, he can keep you from growing closer to the Lord. Let's pray and we'll talk about it. Father, I pray that you'd bless us tonight. Help us through the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God to have our lives strengthened tonight and to see your plan for putting the devil on the road, for putting the devil out of his stronghold, putting the devil out of his place where he's holding us bondage in so many cases. I pray you'd bless us tonight. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. And for his sake, amen. Egypt is a picture of the world. And Pharaoh is a picture of the devil. And when the Hebrew people spent 400 years in Egypt, that bondage grew worse and worse and worse. And they were, they were trapped. And they couldn't get out. And God sent Moses down to release them to lead them out. He had to convince the Hebrews, first of all, that they needed to be delivered. I mean, when Moses first went down there, uh, you know, he made a couple of missteps, it seemed. And so they're saying, man, <laughs> you're making things harder on us, Moses. Just leave us alone. We'd rather, we'd rather serve in this bondage and at least have some onions and garlics to eat and not get whipped so much. We'll serve, we'll serve the devil, but just leave us alone. And it took a while for Moses to convince the Hebrews that they needed to be delivered. And sometimes it's that way with Christians. They don't realize they're in bondage. The devil does have control. He has a stronghold. And they're having a real hard time being a Christian. Well, God has a plan in the New Testament age to deliver his people, the Christian, his church, from bondage. Even though we're saved, we can be in bondage. Satanic, satanic bondage is a real thing. Now, and we, we see in other countries, I've been to India, and it looked like over there that the demonic activity was rampant because there's a lot of illiteracy, and it's a third world country, and so people kind of expect that in a third world country. But can I just tell you, there's a lot of it running rampant in America, and we just, it's disguised as other things. But there's a lot of satanic activity going on and Satan is having a heyday in the lives of a lot of Christians. And just look at it this way. If I've got a little place about four miles out of town. Let's say I give an acre to Norbert Schnord right in the middle of my, my little plot of land. I give him an acre there. Give him a, a deed. Sign it over to him. And then he starts having drunken parties, throwing trash around, making noise and loud music all night long, and it just gets unbearable. And I go to Norbert, and I say, Norbert, look, you're going to have to move out. I, I'm sorry I ever invited you in. You've got to leave. I can't put up with this anymore. And Norbert says, I ain't leaving. You gave me a deed. It's signed. It's legal. I'm not moving. I'm staying right here. And you'll just have to put up with me. Well, you know, that's what the devil does in the lives of a lot of Christians. He sets up camp because we gave him. The scripture we read, neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. Many times we have given him a place in our life in a weak place and we can't regain it because we've given him legal authority to be there. And you know what that legal authority is? When... We go through life reveling in sin and it's, uh, it's unconfessed sin. That's giving the devil place. That's giving the devil every right to be there. That's the devil's playground. <laughs> you give an inch and he'll take a mile. I had a little dog. <laughs> she was part dachshund and part something else, traveling salesman, I guess. And... Uh, Missy, she, uh, she died a year or so ago. I hate to lose that little dog. First time I ever cried over a dog. A grown man. I had to take her out in the barn lot and bury her, and I just cried like a baby. I was looking around to see if anybody was watching me crying over a dog. <laughs> but I had to bury the poor little thing. She was my buddy, Missy. Well, out in our old, we got an old shed. It's about 150-foot long chicken house, and it's just full of junk. The people who lived there before us 25 years ago when we bought it, the people had it half full of of junk that was 
lot of it's, most of it's just no good. It's just junk. And so we moved in and added more junk to that junk. And so it's just cluttered up. Now, I'm going to clean it up one day. <clears throat> you know how that goes, right? I'm going to clean it up one day. But it's junked up so much that there was a groundhog moved in. I don't know if it's one that predicts the weather or not, Brother Paul, but it, this groundhog moved in. And he dug a hole, and there's this old metal, uh, about an eight-foot diameter chicken brooder that's li overlived its time. It's laying over there in the corner, and that old groundhog got under there, and he dug a hole in the ground. And I don't know how far down he went, but that groundhog went way down there. He'd scattered dirt, pulled dirt out of that hole, and he was embedded in there. And he was there for several years. I don't know whether he lived that long or if he just ha kept having kids, and they all moved in when he died. I don't know. But... There was a groundhog in there. Missy would go out there. When I'd, when I'd uh, realize she'd come up missing, I'd go look for her. And she's out there at that groundhog hole. And she's down in there with, all you can see is her back leg sticking out, and she's barking, barking at that groundhog, growling at that gro groundhog. Now, she spent three or four years, maybe longer, chasing that groundhog. She could never get him from being entrenched in that hole. The devil takes up residence when we give place to the devil. Listen to me. When we give place to the devil, he moves in, he digs in, and he sets up a campground. He sets up a stronghold. He sets up a fort. And from there he works. And that old groundhog would go out of that hole and he'd dig holes all over the rest of our orchard, all over the place. I mean, he was a nuisance, worse than a hog rooting around. We'd never get rid of him. I guess he finally died of old age. Missy never did whip him. <laughs> Devil does that. Right. Devil finds out, listen, he finds out where your weak spot is. Yep, right. You know, you know yours. You know which place I'm talking about. The Lord just poked you and reminded you of it just now. <laughs> and that's where the devil finds soft digging. And he digs in like a groundhog. And he sets up camp there. And you can't get rid of the rascal because you gave place to him and he's hanging on. And he's going to stay there until something happens that you don't have the power currently to do. In order to dislodge the devil, there's going to have to be three steps to take place. And I think we'll see them in this passage of Scripture. Number one, there has to be repentance. I mean, when, when you're doing wrong, there, God's not looking for excuses. God's not looking for explanations. God's looking for repentance. When we're doing wrong, when we have sin, he just wants you to repent. So there has to be, number one, repentance. Confess it, forsake it, deal with it. And then secondly, uh, in this same passage of Scripture, we'll see that, that he has to, the man who's going to dislodge the devil, get him out of life, is not going to just be repentant, but he's going to be renewed. Verse twenty. 3 and 24 says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. We read that. That you put on the new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. Now you're never, you're never going to get victory over the devil until you repent of something that's going on that shouldn't be there. And secondly, repentance is not just enough. It takes some renewing so you don't fall back in that same old habit again. And then number three, there's something else going to go on, and that's resistance. The Bible says in James, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. So there's got to be repentance, resistance, and renewal. If we don't do that, we're not going to have success. Let's walk through these steps one at a time. First of all, repentance. I want us to look at the context here in verse number 27, <clears throat> and you'll see what he's talking about. The, the fact that there has to be repentance is shown to us right here in verse number 27. Let me read it again. Neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. What kind of things gives place to the devil in the first place? What gives place to the devil? Well, we're looking at the context of this. See, any text outside of the context is a pretext. 
And so we want to stay with the context. He's talking about not giving place to the devil. How, well, how do we give place to the devil in the first place? Well, number one, by lying. Look at verse 25. Wherefore, putting away, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of, an, one of another. Look, if, if, we're, if we're not honest, if we're not honest in our life, and we don't have honesty as a character, as a virtue, if we don't have honesty as a habit that we follow day by day, then we create a climate that the devil's going to move in right in that area, right there. If that's, why do you think God put that right there in the Bible? Put away lying. Well, he wants us to have honesty. Otherwise, we're just inviting the devil in. In a place, the Bible says that the, that the devil's a liar and the father of it, John 8, 44. God's kingdom, on the other hand, is a kingdom of truth built on truth. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, that he is the truth. Jesus is the truth. In John 17, 17, he says, thy word is truth. In 1 John 5, verse 6, thy spirit is truth. And so in the kingdom of God, God places a grand premium upon honesty and truth. And so the Bible tells us in order to not make place for the devil to move in. We have to, first of all, be honest. Then he mentions another one, stealing. In uh, the same passage of Scripture, we read it a little while ago. I'm not looking at it now. Oh, verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Stealing. And again, what kind of goes back to the same area of weakness. If we're not honest, we'll steal. And I'm just going to say this. I, I think if somebody would, would steal a Coca-Cola, they're capable of stealing a brand new car. Stealing a Tootsie Roll. I love Tootsie Rolls. I've been tempted a time or two. If you steal a Tootsie Roll, you might steal $500. And when we do that, dishonesty again opens the door for the devil to move in. And the Bible says, give not the devil a place in your life, in your heart. Luke chapter 16 and verse number 10, listen to this. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in that which is much. So what's he saying? He's saying if you're faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in the big things. Amen? Two of us believe that. Connor and I believe it. If you're unfaithful, on the other hand, look at what the rest of the verse says. And he that is unfaithful in that which is least is unfaithful also in that which is much. So if we're unfaithful a little bit, we'll probably be unfaithful a lot. It doesn't say you might be. It says is. Sounds like a done deal. Are you a thief? Let him that stole steal no more. Kids, let me ask you, do you steal things at school, like stealing answers for your work? Well, I was principal at a Christian school for a number of years. We had an ACE curriculum, and, and the kids would go up to a scoring table. They had to work in their workbook and then go up to the scoring table, get permission to go up there and take an answer key, and they had to mark their answers wrong if they were wrong. Guess what? Those little rascals would lie, cheat, and steal. <laughs> I look over the shoulder sometimes. Boy, they're just going through. I'm seeing all these wrong answers. They're just gliding over them, not marking a one. You know what they're doing? They're stealing answers that they didn't have. And we can steal things sometimes without even knowing it. Sometimes we steal somebody's reputation by gossiping about them. Notice the third thing that says we're, we're talking about things that in the context of this passage, things that invite the devil into a weak area where he can take up residence from which he can wage war on us. In verse 29, it talks about filthy speech. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is 
good to the use of edifying that he may minister grace unto the hearers. Ephesians 4.29. Now skip over to verse 4, five, chapter 5, verse 4. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Filthy speech. Not only is the devil a thief and wants to make you a thief, but he wants you also to have filthy speech. It never ceases to amaze me. Uh, people that profess Christ as Savior and then Sometimes when you're in, kind of in the background listening, you hear them saying things they shouldn't be saying as a Christian. <laughs> My mother, she was a stickler for avoiding words that even had just a little bit of off-color connotation to them. You know, when she paddled us, she paddled our bottom. She didn't even, she didn't even believe in saying the word B-U-T-T. -T. That was a cuss word. And we got fast and loose with it in recent days. Uh, if, she, if her and another woman was in the living room, I remember them saying this because it was a mystery to me. I didn't know what they were talking about. They didn't, when a woman was with child, they didn't use the P word. That was considered just a little bit too uh, risque. They talk about her being PG. Does anybody ever hear that? Her PG. Because yeah, she didn't want to take a chance of saying something that was off color. I use the term because the Bible uses the term with child. Because it's just a Bible term. When Mary was carrying Jesus in her womb, it is said that she was with child. I think it's just good, clean speech. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. There's a certain kind of language that's just foul, foul language. I used to go over to Tate's store, there where I grew up in Izzard County, and those old men be sitting around that pot belly stove in the wintertime, chewing tobacco and spitting in the ash can, and, and they're telling stories and, and telling big tales, some of them I doubt if they were true, and they'd be talking, and every once in a while, one of them let out a big long string of cuss words. Most of them respected the people that were in there, and it's kind of a community gathering place, especially if there's a woman in there, boy, they, they watched their mouth, they just didn't say anything that's off color or vulgar, foul, but we had one guy, I called him Cussin Reed, old Reed had the foulest mouth I ever heard, and I'll mention Reed again, but I want to get on to this one first, bitterness, where are those weak spots, according to the context of our text, of our text where are the, those weak spots where the devil might recognize a good place to move into your life and set up a campground? We're talking about brain, bonding or breaking the bondage of Satan in our life. Bitterness is one of those. In verse number 30 it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Cuss and read. When I first got saved, I was 29 years old. Preacher said we ought to be witnesses for the Lord, and so we started going out and visiting people, and trying to win some people to the Lord. And he sent us to see old Cussin Reed one night. Reed's wife had passed away a few years before, and Reed was he'd lived in the community all of his life, and in a lot of ways he was a good guy, but man, he just had a foul mouth. And we sat down and talked to old Reed about uh, about the Lord. I figured he'd probably throw us out on our ear beat us up or something but he didn't he was nice and listened to us he even admitted he needed to be saved but here's what he told us after we went through some scriptures with him showing him how to how to trust the Lord as Savior what the Lord had done for him he looked at me and he said well Rick we just lived like a mile apart for all all of my life and he said Rick I'll just tell you he said I know you're right and know I need to get saved but he said I I don't want to get saved just yet. I'm going to. But I don't want to get just, just get saved right now. I said, well, how come, Reed? He said, well, and he's a lot older than me. He was older than my dad. <clears throat> Reed said, I, I'm not ready to get saved. There's something i got to do first. I said, what are you, what are you thinking you got to do? He said, well, old Jerry up there at the store, this little community store I was talking about earlier, he said, old Jerry, he said, I was in there one day, and he didn't like the way I was talking and things I was saying, and, he got on to me, and we had, got a, had a few words. And 
Jerry pulled out a gun. He said, I haven't got over it yet. He said, I'm going to get even with him. And he said, I know a Christian ought not to do stuff like that. So I'm going to get even with him and then I'll get saved. I said, Reed, that's not the way you do it. He said, well, I know, but I, that's the way I'm going to do it anyway. I couldn't talk him into getting saved. The Bible says, get rid of the bitterness. Now, if a lost man like Reed has a bitterness in him and he's clinging to it, I can sort of understand, doesn't make it right, but I can kind of understand, I can kind of, I can kind of get it down in my understanding how a lost man could be that way. But when you've got the Holy Spirit of God living in you as a Christian, you know the Word of God, and the Word of God says you don't cling to bitterness. You get rid of it. And if you've got bitterness in your heart, listen, I'm talking probably to some people right now in this room or on the camera, I'm talking to some people probably have some bitterness towards somebody. And you had not got over it yet. That is a perfect campground for Satan to move into your life and weaken you so that he's got that acre of ground in the middle of your farm and he's not going to give it up. Bitterness. It'll keep you in bondage to the devil. The devil is bitter. Remember in the book of Revelation, when it, in the tribulation time, uh, Israel is going to be fleeing for her life, national Israel. And it shows the devil as the, the dragon. And the dragon is chasing Israel through the wilderness. The devil is bitter against God's people. And you're God's people, and he's bitter against you. And just because you get bitter doesn't mean you have to stay that way. When you're bitter... You're more like the devil probably than any time else. Get rid of the bitterness. <laughs> I heard the story about the old couple. <clears throat> and she had good eyes, but she couldn't hear hardly anything. And he didn't have good eyes, but he could hear good. So she'd do the driving, and he'd do the talking. <clears throat> well, they were on a trip one day going from Cersei to Little Rock, and they had to stop and get some gas. And some other customer there pumping his gas, and he struck up a conversation with the old man. He said, uh, said where, are you, where are you headed? He said, well, we're, we're going to Little Rock. He said, well, that's a nice car you got there. He said, did you get pretty good gas mileage? The old woman said, told her husband, what, what did he say? He said, he asked me where we were from, and I told him Cersei. She said, but he said something else. What did he say? He said, well, he asked what kind of car we had and whether it got good gas mileage. And I told him it was a Chrysler, and it gets pretty good gas mileage. So a few minutes, uh, he asked uh, the, the other customer asked the old man, he said, uh, so you're going to Little Rock, huh? He said, uh, yes, sir. She said, what did he say again? He said, well, he asked me again if we were going to Little Rock. And I told him, yes, we're going to Little Rock. And the other customer said, well, I used to know a woman at Little Rock. She was the meanest, cantankerous, bitterest woman, most hateful woman I ever saw in my life. The old woman sitting behind the wheel said, what did he say? He said, he thinks he knows your sister. <laughs> Bitterness. The devil loves to find that kind of heart and he'll move in and he'll set up a camp right there. Well, there's something else that's mentioned there in our passage in verse number 31 is slandering. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. Bitterness often leads to slander. We get bitter and we want to tell everybody else how bad that person is that we're bitter about. The devil is known as the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12.10 Devil, the word devil means... Uh, a slanderer, and that's certainly what he does. And when we imitate him by being a slanderer, a gossip, an accuser, then we're being like the devil. I don't think Jesus would want to move in to that kind of heart until we move the devil out. Then we're moving on to one other thing, malice. He says in verse 31, And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. With all malice. What does malice mean anyway? Malice comes from bitterness. You get wounded by somebody or feel like you're wounded. Then that turns to wrath. And then wrath 
gets to burning on the inside. It's kind of a slow burn, and finally the embers catch up and it starts blazing, full blaze. And then there's clamor. Clamor's loud speaking, railing. And then the clamor turns to evil speaking. And malice is that anger that wants to get even with somebody. You're angry at them, and you want to make them hurt. Is there anybody you know that you want them to hurt? If so, there's a weak place in your heart's ground that the devil finds an easy place to move into when you're bitter and you want to make somebody pay for what they did. Even Jesus on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he was dying. I doubt that any of us have suffered that way. And if Jesus didn't have malice and want to get even and clamoring and anger on the cross, then we wouldn't be like him if we did have that. Sometimes we get carried away. We've got all these things that we've just mentioned. All these things are working inside of us, and we begin to say things that we wish we'd never said. You know the, you know the bad thing about blurting things out that we didn't really mean to say? is that once they're blurted out, you can't gather them up and put them back. They do the damage once they're out there. And we can't ever gather them back in again. It ends up with malice, a desire to hurt somebody. And when this happens, what's going on with God? He's the one wanting to sanctify us. He's the one wanting to draw us closer to Him. He's the one who wants us to be like Him. What's happening? Well, in verse number 30 of our text, it says, And grieve not... Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. When we're doing these things, we got that wrath boiling up in us. We're angry. We're clamoring. We start yelling, yelling at your wife or yelling at your husband. And, and they say, well, don't yell at me. I'm not yelling. <laughs> and then we want to put some hurt on them. The Bible says we grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Can you imagine how the Spirit of God must grieve when we imitate the devil and let him take up residence in our heart and he's working through us to cause hurt to other people. We're saved and yet we have become a nest for Satan. <laughs> now you're going to you're going to want to get rid of him. So the first thing you do is repent. Repent. Whatever we have allowed to creep into our life, God doesn't want us just to say we're sorry. He wants us to repent. That means turn from what we're doing and stop it. Quit it. And then secondly, after repentance comes resistance. And we mentioned that verse, James 4, 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. If you don't resist him, then he's not going. It's kind of like the guy that took up, Norbert Schnord took up residence in the center of my little acreage, and I go over and, and say, uh, Norbert, you're going to have to get out of here. I can't put up with this. And he said, I'm not going. Now, if I pull a Joe Biden and say, okay, that's all right then. <laughs> Stay if you want to. Stay if you want to, Chinese balloon. Go ahead and take your pictures, and when you get back over on the other side of the country, we'll blow you out of the sky. If I don't resist, when Satan is doing a work in me, when Satan has taken up residence in me, and I'm letting him work through me, it's not just enough to repent and say, I'm quitting this nonsense. You then have to, t have to take the next step of resisting. He says, I'm not leaving. You say, yes, you are. The Holy Spirit's stronger than you are, and you're leaving. And you don't give up. Hey, when you've got temptation to do wrong, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to quit your bad habits. If you were a drinker before you got saved, it doesn't always come easy to give that up. And some people, 
thank God when I got saved, I was, I was bad to drink before I got saved, and that was one of my huge, huge habits. And God took the desire away from me just like that when I got saved, but he doesn't do that for everybody. Some people have a strong battle. And if you nurse that, you just don't say, I'm going to resist. I'm not going where they serve it. I'm not hanging out with people who are partying with it. I'm just going to resist. If, my, if I'm driving down the street and I'm tempted to go in that liquor store, I'm going to turn around and go the other way. I'm going to resist. Repentance and then resistance. There must be resistance. And then thirdly, renewal. In our text, in Ephesians 4.23 it says, and be renewed, there's our key word, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man. Put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. True holiness. Renewal. See, when we first get saved, everything doesn't seem to be renewed, does it? I mean, just because you got saved doesn't mean you quit your cussing all at once. If it's a habit, it's hard to get rid of. You need to be renewed. So what do you do? See, when you get saved, <laughs> there's a problem with sin. It's, it's in there. And when you try to push the sin out without putting something else back in its place, it creates a vacuum. Remember the, the uh, parable uh, that Jesus told about the, the man who cast out seven evil spirits, got rid of the seven, but he didn't replace it with anything. And then there, was, there were more that moved in. And his last case was worse than the first. It creates a vacuum. So you can't just quit stuff, but you've got to quit it and replace it. The replacement theory. If you're going to quit cussing, replace it with praising the Lord. Just praise the Lord. Find a way to praise the Lord. Say the things that God would say if he was in your place. Replace. If, you, if you're going to give up cigarette smoking, a lot of times one of the, one of the strategies is replace it with something else. Some, somebody might replace it with gum. Somebody might replace it by chewing on a toothpick. There's ways to replace things. And so when we give up stuff, we replace it with good stuff. Put off the old man, but put on the new. Get rid of the old, take in the new. That will drive the devil out. Verse 18 of chapter 5 says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Now what's he going to replace that with? But be filled with the Spirit. You know the answer to rooting the devil out? It takes a renewal. After there's been repentance, Resistance, then renewal. Being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And it's not just simply asking the Spirit of God in, but it's doing the thing to invite the Holy Spirit in. You see, if you're full of the Holy Spirit, listen to this, if you're full of the Holy Spirit, there's no room in there for the devil. Isn't that true? And if you're full of the devil, there's not room for the Holy Spirit. So we push the devil out. Break his stronghold and then invite the Holy Spirit of God in and do the things mentioned in the Bible that would invite the Holy Spirit to live there. Praising the Lord, church attendance, devotion time, prayer, memorizing scripture, just doing the things that are simple but replacement theory, inviting God in and pushing the devil out. That's where victory comes from. That's how we get more of God in our life. That's how we get sanctified. You know, you'll never be sanctified sinless. We're not buying into that doctrine that some teach that you just get so sanctified that you don't sin anymore. I had a Sunday school teacher in the church where I grew up. Now, I wasn't saved. I didn't really know, but I, I remember her saying some things like she didn't sin anymore. Miss Pearlie, bless her heart, she was a sweet lady, but she believed in the entire sanctification. And she believed she, that she had got so holy that she just didn't sin anymore. I think she just sinned when she said she didn't sin anymore. That might be pride. 
we still have the flesh to deal with. And we won't be rid of it until that rapture happens, the resurrection that goes with it. We get a brand new body as we're going up to meet the Lord. We can leave the old flesh behind and say, Hallelujah, I don't have to deal with that anymore. And then we'll be sanctified sinless. Whatever Jesus is like when you go up to be with him, the Bible says that we will be like him. I'm looking forward to that day. When we don't have to fight the devil, when we don't have to fight sin, when we don't have to have a strategy to have the Holy Spirit root the devil out. And we do need to have a strategy. Follow these scriptural principles in Ephesians chapter 4 and chapter 5 and you'll find that you can please the Lord. Don't try to repent until you're honest and face your sin. Don't try to resist until you've repented. And don't try to be filled until you resist the devil. Maybe somebody's not saved and they just need to say, Lord, I'm a sinner like, like the Bible says and I just need to trust the Lord as my Savior. You could do that tonight. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and eyes closed if you're able. We'll go to the Lord in prayer and then I'm going to invite you to the altar if you want to pray. And if you've never been saved, I invite you to come. You can trust the Lord as Savior tonight. And you'll never, ever have to worry about hell ever again. It doesn't mean the devil will be completely gone out of your life. He'll still try to move in. But he'll never completely capture you and you can keep him rooted out where you can have a successful Christian life. Father, I pray that you'd bless us during the invitation time. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to take advantage of this time to pray, to repent, to resist, to renew. And Lord, I pray that those who suspect that the devil has a foothold, that you'd use this time for them to say, Lord, please fill me with, with your Holy Spirit. I want to be so full of the Holy Ghost that there's no room for the devil in there. I pray that those who are not saved would trust you tonight. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and I invite you to come.